All right, well, we're going to have some energy because I'm going to try. Because <clears throat> we need to be happy because we serve a risen Savior, right? So I'm going to let you in on a little secret of mine. Not a secret, it's just one of my prayer requests, and I'm going to ask you to pray with me. So um, I'm praying. Whoa, you threw me off, LD. I was like, I thought you were over there. Did you just... Sorry, I was just like, whoa, I'm really mixed up now. All right, so here, here's my, my prayer request. I want you to pray with me. Um, I'm not about numbers, but I, there's two things I'm praying for. One, I'm praying that within three years, Lord willing, our sanctuary is packed out with people. That's one of my prayers. And my second prayer is that we lift the roof off of our sanctuary when we sing to our God. Those are my two prayers. And so I'm asking you to pray with me. If you want to sing louder, that's fine. But those are two things that I'm praying and my third thing I'm praying, in three to five years, if Lord willing, we have Wick Hall packed out with children. Because we have a big God. And I think our, our God can do big things. And I'm in a habit of praying for big things. And God, I've seen God do some of them. So I invite you to pray those things with me, and we'll just see how God works. So... Um, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy. Um, I have wrestled over the two weeks on how to do this, because if you remember two weeks ago, we were supposed to cover verses six, no, 5 through 7, and we only got through verse 5. And so we're only going to go verses 6 and 7, and I don't know if I'll go as long as I normally do. So just, and I was like, well, I could add some verses, but if I added verses, then I've got to go to this this far, and if I go that far, there's no way that I can get that in one message. So you hear a little bit of my struggle. But I want, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I want to read verses 1 through 7 this morning together. It says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope? To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men, strained from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, I pray, God, that you would teach us your ways so that we may walk in your truth. Lord Jesus, we don't want to be a church that simply hears the word of God. But Lord, we want to hear the word of God and then we want to apply the things to our lives because we love you. Lord, we want to be a church that's a city on a hill that proclaims the name of Christ, not only in our words, but also in our actions. Lord, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought and clarity of mind as I share just a little bit of the things that I have been learning. We ask that you'd receive the honor and the glory in Christ's name we pray, amen. I failed to mention at the beginning, so I'm sorry I'm going to say it now, but please be praying for the summers there in California. Michelle's mom um, is just having some pretty substantial health issues. Um, my understanding is that she is either at the beginning to the middle stages of dementia. And so they'll be there until next Friday, so please be praying for them as well. Um, and also, thank you, Dan, for preaching last week. I heard great things. So I said, you have to go longer than I do so that they let me come back. So did he, did he do that? No? Long, was he long-winded? Okay. Doggone it. We're going to have to talk, Dan. So, 
All right, so I want us to look at, really, this is the goal of the warning. If you remember earlier in 1 Timothy, we really had where Paul commissioned Timothy. He says, Timothy, you're going to go out, and you are going to pastor a church. And Paul says, I'm going to go to Macedonia. So he really says, Timothy, it's time for you to fly solo. But he didn't go in, Timothy didn't go into a, a, a wonderful situation. In verse 3, he says, I want you to remain on at Ephesus so that you can instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Paul says, Timothy, this is, this is your, your commissioning. This is what you're going to do. And then last week, or two weeks ago, we looked at the, the message was exemplified. If you remember, I asked the question two weeks ago, how are you and I doing at living out the message, living out the message of biblical love? And that's what we looked at two weeks ago in verse 5. He says, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Paul says, Timothy, as you teach this church, as you teach these believers, your message is to be a message of biblical love. And we looked, at, that we looked and we saw that the message was, was a love that was produced from a justified heart. I think so often it's easy for us to lose sight of our justified heart, isn't it? Isn't it easy just to become mediocre? Oh, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. Don't, don't you hear people say that? All the time. But have you maybe lost sight of a justified heart? The power of the gospel that, that he transformed my heart. He, he took me from eternal damnation. He saved me, brought me into his family. And he says, you're justified. That word justified is a legal term. You are made right with God. This is the biblical love. The love that we are to show our world, our brothers and sisters in Christ, is to be biblical love. It comes from a justified heart. It comes from a good conscience. The idea of a good conscience is that is we are dealing with our sins. And does anybody sin? I do. Okay, Buddy and I are the only ones. The rest of you will talk later. We're all sinners, aren't we? We all struggle with sin. And, and, and as, as Paul writes to Timothy, he says, this is the goal of your message. It's to be love from a justified heart. It's to be a love that's produced from a good conscience. That is, we are dealing with the sin that we struggle with. We are confessing our sins, as 1 John 1, 9 tells us. And this is a love that is produced, it says at the end of verse 5, a good conscience and a sincere faith. The idea of a sincere sincere faith is it is a love produced from a faith devoid of hypocrisy have you heard people say i don't go to church because of all the hypocrites have you heard that excuse man i hear it all the time and you know what i tell them i said well you're being a hypocrite why don't you get join us why don't you join us because isn't it true that we all struggle with hypocrisy isn't it easy to put on the christian facade life is all good how are you? I'm great. My kids look at me and they're like, Dad, you were just hollering at us at home. We have this talk a lot at home. But see, this is a love that's produced from a faith devoid of hypocrisy. That is, we are dealing with the hypocrisy. And this is the, the goal of the instruction that Timothy is to preach to the church. We learned earlier on about the daunting task and the message that was assigned to Timothy. It is the message of the cross for unbelievers. Do you remember that in verse 1? In verse 1 he says, And of Christ Jesus who is what? Who is our hope? This is the message of the cross for unbelievers and the message of love that is biblical love for the believers. The same task and message are assigned to every believer. Every believer, this morning, I just want us to, to focus and to draw our attention to the message distorted. 
Two weeks ago, we saw the message exemplified. And this morning, I want us to look at how it was and how it sometimes is distorted, even in this day and age. And I want to show you. But the question for both of us to contemplate is this. How are we doing at living out the message of biblical love every second of every day? It's easy to do it when life's going our way, isn't it? It is for me. When times are good, it's easy to live out biblical love. But when times are hard, when times are difficult, that's when the rubber meets the road, isn't it? Biblical love. When times are hard, when we lose our brother, we lose our brother in Christ. Ralph is no more pain, no more suffering, worshiping at the feet of Jesus. Isn't that great? Praise God. But we still mourn his loss. Many of you know, I think it was Miss Fran. I didn't have the joy of knowing her, but we mourn her loss as well. We're to show biblical love when a world is spinning out of control from our perspective. We're to show biblical love when we're in the doctor's office and the doctor says, I don't know what's wrong with you. We're to show biblical love if there's ever controversy in a church. There's never controversy in a church, right? <laughs> But we're still to show biblical love even then. We're to show biblical love when there's not donuts before Sunday school hour. We're to show biblical love when the coffee's not as strong as we would like it. We're to show biblical lo- I could go on and on. I'm not really saying that, Miss Carol. The coffee's wonderful. But you get my point, right? We're always to be showing biblical love. We're to show biblical love to our neighbors. We're to show biblical love when we go to the grocery store, when we go to Walmart, when we go to Sam's. We're to show biblical love when we have the repair people come to the house to fix stuff. We're to show biblical love to our town even when they do things that we don't like with the approval of the marijuana shops. We're still to show biblical love. I don't know about you, but I sure have been challenged as I reflect on how am I showing biblical love. It doesn't mean that we agree with what's being done, but it does mean that we continue to demonstrate biblical love in the way that we interact with people, right? Look at what it says in verse 6. In verse 6 it says, For some men, strained from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion. So I want us to look at the message distorted. This was, Timothy was to lead and pastor a church. And and Paul writes and he says, for some men are missing the mark. He says, for some men, look at back in verse 3. He says in verse 3, as I urge you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus. Why? So that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. This would be the same men. Who were these men? If you look down to verse 20, this is interesting. It says in verse 20, among these, I believe this would be those certain men, are Hymenaeus and Alexander whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. The message was being distorted. These men were missing the mark. They were strained from these things. Strained from, it's a verb, It really means to to miss the mark, to err, to deviate, to swerve from. How do we see people and or different religions missing the mark? We do see it, don't we? Let me tell you a couple of stories. When we moved to South Lake, Texas, for my dad to be youth pastor at a church, when I was, I don't know, seven, seven or eight years old. We got to the church, and it was a pretty, pretty small, I mean, small church, I guess I use that term loosely, a hundred, maybe a couple hundred people. We were there, 
And the pastor there um, would regularly share the Word of God and things like that. My brother and I started a landscaping business. We started mowing 20, 25 lawns a week. We ended up doing the pastor's yard. He owned an acre of land, and so it was a big yard to mow. And I noticed things changed dramatically. He never talked to us, but all of a sudden he came up and he put his arm around me. I was like, weird, weird. So I just waited. I mean, I was young and dumb. And I came to find out later on that this individual um, had, had really disqualified himself from the ministry. Misused church's money behind the backs of the church and the elders and things like that. But he missed the mark. He began straying from the truth of God's word. It broke my heart. There's another individual that was a well-known pastor. Um, wrote a book. Wrote a book on raising kids. And now he had an affair with a professional baseball player's wife, left his wife, left his children, no longer a pastor. And now he is taking the word of God and twisting the word of God. And he's saying that we're free as Christians. It was, a, it was a friend of ours. Missing the mark? I can tell you more stories of people who are missing the mark. That's exactly what Timothy was dealing with. These men, these certain men who came into the church, they were straying from these things. They were missing the mark. See, we, we see the word strain from in our text in verse 6, but in, in chapter 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 21, look at what it says there. Chapter 6, verse 21, it says in verse 21, or verse 20, sorry, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Avoid worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed, and thus gone astray from the faith. They've missed the mark. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18, it says there, well, I'll start in verse 16 for the sake of context. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. It may surprise you to know that there are over 4,000 recognized religions in the world today. These religions consist of churches, congregations, faith groups, tribes, cultures, and movements. Even though there are so many, three quarters of the world's population practice one of the five major religions. But how are they missing the mark? I don't want to sit up here this morning and, and just give you names of different religions and people that are missing the mark. I want to sit up here and tell you that you and I have a responsibility, don't we? You and I have a, the same responsibility that was given to Timothy. We are to preach the cross to the unsaved world, and we are to demonstrate biblical love to every person we interact with, right? And I think too often for me, it's easy to become lackadaisy when I think about this task that has been assigned to me. Sometimes it's easy for me to kind of go, oh yeah, I'm a believer. When we say that we're believers, y'all, we should be jumping for joy out of our seats. It, we talked about in youth group in Matthew chapter 9, verses 
oh, I don't know, one through eight, the paralytic. Do y'all remember that? The paralytic? Y'all, it blows my mind. And it's just, as we were talking, I was listening to the students share their thoughts on the passage. The paralytic. There were four men that brought the paralytic to a home. In Mark's account and Luke's account, it says that what did they do? They let him down through the roof. Could you imagine the faith of the paralytic? I mean, I, I just try, I don't know, try to wrap your mind around it. I'm kind of helpless right now, but I'm not hopeless. I'm kind of helpless. I'm dependable on a lot of people to help me. Get up the stairs. Miss Dorothy told me two weeks ago, I don't want you going up the stairs again. I want you to sit up there. And she was like, why are you coming down? I was like, I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> right? But the paralytic, think about it. Four men let him down through the roof into a crowd of people, according to Mark's account. And the faith that he had. And then what happens? Jesus dealt with the religious leaders, didn't he? Head on. He was like, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven and get up and walk and take. And Jesus is like, bam, I'll show you both. And what did the paralytic do? He went home glorifying God. I do care if you're suffering. I do care if you're hurting. I do care if you've lost a loved one. I do. But please don't ever forget the power of the cross. The power of the cross. When we go out of here, we ought to be jumping for joy every second of every day. I can't jump, so I know. Like, but shouldn't people see the joy we have because of our Savior? Because of the message? I don't know. That's just been heavy on my heart as I hear, as I see how the message is distorted and how these men are, are missing the mark. They are saying things that are not true. Folks, we have churches and religions and crazy people in our city or in our town that believe wacko stuff. And what they need is the power of the cross. They don't need us to yell at them. They don't need us to be hateful. They need us to show them biblical love and tell them about how to have a relationship with the living God. And I think for you and I as believers, we get to take the work that God has done in our lives and we get to share that with the world. We get to show biblical love. We have a church up the hill that does not believe in the inerrancy of the word of God. We have churches that are not far from us that teach a works-based salvation. Is that biblical? No. We don't need to be jerks about it. We don't need to be hateful about it. We need to show them the love of God. We need to preach the gospel to them. So for me, as I'm thinking about those things, I'm thinking and praying about, Lord, what can we do for these churches in our area that don't believe in the inerrancy of the word of God? We need to show them biblical love. How can we do that? Oh, do I have ideas. Going on, our, going on in our text, listen to what it says. It says they've turned aside to fruitless discussion. Verse 7 says, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. These men have the wrong aspirations, don't they? They have the wrong goals. They want to become teachers of the law, even though they don't understand that. Have you, ever, have you ever heard kids or maybe some adults who have maybe not so good of aspirations? I had an aspiration. Is that, is that how I say it? I had a goal. My goal in 2003 was I was going to be a rodeo clown. You all laugh. No joke. I was going to be a rodeo clown. I thought there was nothing better than being a rodeo clown, and I could... I could I could be in excellent shape because I got to run fast, right? I like living on the edge. My life could be on the edge with a big old animal chasing me, right? And I wanted to be a youth pastor at that time. And I thought, well, Lord, I could be a rodeo clown. I could be involved in youth ministry because in the ministry, you, you don't focus on the money. You focus on the people. 
And I thought, well, I could do that, and I could supplement my income by being a, a rodeo clown. And then when I'm a rodeo clown on Sunday mornings, I could do church services with the cowboys, and I could share the gospel with them. And then as I worked as a rodeo clown, I could get to where I could get the speaker, and I could be the one that could talk. And as I could talk, I could tell clean jokes, and I could share the gospel with the bullfighters. He's holding on to the bull. Y'all, I had a huge aspiration. Like this, I was set in stone. In fact, I had called, I had met with uh, supposedly a really good rodeo clown in Fort Worth. We had coffee together, and I was signed up to go to rodeo school. Guess what? The Lord said the wrong aspirations. I got in the, we got in the car accident that Wednesday before I went to rodeo clown school. But nothing was stopping those aspirations. But that car wreck did. These men had aspirations. Maybe kids. Have you heard kids talk about their aspirations? You know, I, I have an aspiration that I don't tell a lot of people. I want to be president of the United States of America. I had that one too. And my plan was I was going to run as a Democratic Republican, get into the office and say, I'm neither one. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'd be assassinated within a week. See, I had some bad aspirations. But kids, do your kids or grandkids, do you ever hear their aspirations? Like, I want to take over the world. That was my aspiration last December when I was in the hospital. Y'all remember I had the hip surgery? Not much has changed, has it? I'm still on crutches. <laughs> but I lay in the hospital bed. The nurse came in. He goes, what do, you, what do you want to do today, right? Isn't that what he said? And I think I said that. I want to try to take over the world. And there's a picture at the end of my bed. It said, world domination. That was my aspiration. These men, their aspiration was, was to be teachers of the law. It says in verse 6, they had turned aside to fruitless discussion. The idea of 1 Timothy 1.6, these are men who have swerved from the faith. They've turned aside unto vain talking. In 1 Timothy 5.15, it says, For some have already turned aside to follow Satan. 2 Timothy 4.4, 4, And will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to miss. The idea of fruitless discussion is empty. It is foolish discussion. One commentator says this, There is content in what the false teachers propagate, but it does not lead anyone to holy living. The next verse tells us that these men are teach, who are teachers, their aspiration was to become teachers of the law. We see Jesus interacting with a lot of people who are teachers of the law, don't we? Yeah, Jesus had a lot of interaction with them. Even as we were talking in youth this morning, the, the, uh, the, the religious leaders, they were like, they were thinking evil thoughts, and they are like, what, what is he doing? And they accused Jesus of blaspheming, blaspheming. They tried to catch him in the wrong in Luke 5, 17, it says, One day he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. There were these religious leaders. They were teachers of the law in Acts 5, 3, 5, 34. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law. This was these men's aspirations. They wanted to be a teacher of the law. They had the wrong aspirations. So, you and I, brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm talking to those who know Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have a responsibility, and that is to share the message of the cross with every person we interact with, unbeliever and believer. 
We are to demonstrate biblical love every second of every day because God calls us to. I want to to conclude in just a minute, but I want to read a, a lengthy quote, if I may. I think they say it very well. He says, quote, Love is the authentic outward expression of Christian faith. Issues from the person whose emotional and volitional sender has experienced cleansing by God. Here's the longer one. And this goes back to verse 5. Paul contrasts the goal of his instruction with that of the false teachers. He seeks to produce in the church that which God requires, love toward him and those who are his. It is essential that believers love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Love indeed is the mark of the Christian. Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. John added, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Agape, love, is the love of choice, of will. It involves self-denial and self-sacrifice to benefit others. This kind of love flows from three sources. The concept of a pure heart is a rich Old Testament theme. The psalmist asks, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He then answers this question, He who has clean hands and a pure heart. After his sin with Bathsheba, David cried out in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Psalm 73.1 exclaims, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, a heart washed by regeneration. In Titus 3.5, An obedient heart is a pure heart. A second prerequisite for love is a good conscience. Is that which is perfect producing pleasure, satisfaction, and a sense of well-being. The conscience is the God-created, self-judging faculty of man. It either affirms or accuses a person. The mind knows the standard of right and wrong, and when that standard is violated, the conscience reacts to accuse, producing guilt, shame, doubt, fear, remorse, or despair. Those with a pure heart will not be condemned by their conscience to maintain a blameless conscience, one free of offense against either God or man was Paul's goal. Peace, confidence, joy, hope, courage, and contentment are the results of a conscience that is not accusing, and love will flow. Finally, love comes from a sincere faith, one without any pretense. The hypocritical faith of the false teachers will not produce it. Real trust and love go together. As noted in chapter 1 of this commentary, <laughs> Timothy was marked by such a sincere faith. End quote. We get to live out that biblical love. Does that get you excited? I, I don't know. I, may, maybe I'm just off the wall. Like, if I'm going to be honest with you, this past week we were up at my dad's cabin. And it was a great time. I didn't have much fun because I felt sorry for myself a lot of the time. I did. I'm not happy about my leg. I'm not frustrated. I mean, I'm not like, woohoo, thank you, Lord. But I sat up here and I said two weeks ago, I was like, okay, even we need to show biblical love even with the medical people. Remember that? And the Lord said, okay, go now, Jake. <laughs> Golly. Right? But when I get my eyes off myself and my circumstances, I go, man, God, thank you for calling me, allowing me to be adopted into your family. Yeah, let me go show biblical love. And y'all know what happened? It was so crazy cool. Last week on Monday, I went down and I had an MRI. A lady came by and she goes, hey, are you Jake? And I was like, why you ask? I didn't say it, but I was like, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, it's going to be about 45 minutes late because we have an emergency MRI. I said, okay. And so I sat there. 
I sat there, I sat there, I sat there, and finally she came in, and, and we went back, and she was like, okay, let's do your MRI, and so we got all set up, and she's like, well, you can't take your crutches into the MRI room. I said, okay, I can walk, no problem, and so I just walked in there, I got on the table, and she's like, what music do you want? She like blew my ears out and all that, and I laid there and got done. She's like, okay, we're all done, it's great. So I got up, and I walked over, and I got my crutches. And I went in and I tried to get my shoes on and tie my shoes and that was a task in and of itself, but I did it. And I was getting my wallet and stuff and, and so like I'm in the little changing room, right? And I hear on the other side, she goes, um, I'll be back in a minute. I don't know how you feel when like people in the medical field say, say that, but I thought, hmm, I must have did something well. So I, I, so I just sat there I heard her come back in, so I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready, I'm going to go now. She said, um, I just talked to the radiologist, and don't put any weight on your leg at all. <laughs> okay. And she said, he will read your report today, and you will hear something today. I thought, hmm, I've never been told that before. Okay. So I got home, and I was home an hour, two hours, and the doctor calls. I thought, whoa, this is cool. This never happened. And it was the nurse, and she was like, uh, don't put any weight on your leg at all. We sent referrals to two orthopedic surgeons. First one to call you, get in there. I said, can you tell me what happened? She said, it looks like your leg is broken. <laughs> okay. But this is crazy. In the MRI room, she told me that, and she shut the door, and she said, Jake, can I ask you a question? I said, oh, sure. She said, am I wrong that God has determined the day that we're going to die? I said, no, you're right. God knows the day of your birth and the day of your death. And man, the gospel's wide open. So I'm like, Woo yes, Lord. And man, we're talking. Like 20 minutes back in the MRI room, I felt bad for the person who was waiting for theirs. But we were talking, and she was like, Jake, can you tell me about the Levitical priesthood? And I was like, man, I love Leviticus. Yeah, let's talk about it. And we're sitting back there talking about all this stuff and the animal sacrifices and this and that and the grain offering and the peace offering and the sin offering and all that. I was like, look, we don't offer animal sacrifices today because who God is and God sent Jesus. And it was beautiful. God gave me a chance to show biblical love even in the medical field, even as sorry as I feel for myself. So what? What about you and I? What do we get to do? Brothers and sisters, if we know Christ, how are you doing at living out biblical love every second of every day? I realize life is hard. I realize that hard things happen. I realize that it's, but that doesn't change the love that God showed us. It doesn't show us, it doesn't change the fact that we get to live out biblical love. That blows my mind. God in his mercy, despite my sin, my frailty, and all my brokenness, and the sins that I struggle with, God forgives me, and he says, Jake, I'll still use you. He says the same for you. Isn't that awesome? God says he'll still use you. We get to live out this love. This is the same kind of love that our father demonstrated by sending his son, his perfect son, to die a horrific death because of you and I. This is a love produced from a justified heart, a clear conscience, a life devoid of hypocrisy. That's the love we get to show. If you and I are to do great things for our Savior, then we must do two things. Love God and love people. Love God and love people. We must do it because the message is being distorted all over Cedar Ridge. It is. And you have the truth in your laps or on your phones or tablets or whatever. You have the truth. We need to go out of here glorifying God every second of every day, no matter what comes our way. Then, of course, if you don't know Christ, what is the challenge? Repent and believe in Jesus. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. In Romans 10, he says, Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Isn't that awesome? Like, I think that's awesome. Like, I don't, I'm like, Lord, bring it on. If you want me to break my other leg or break my head or whatever, God, let me just think halfway clearly so that I can tell people about Jesus. We all get to do that. I can't, I am so excited. 